Okay, let's get into this. You know, God works through spiritual laws. These spiritual laws are very understandable. They're very real. They're very consistent. The law of gravity is very consistent. Uh, what happens if we're going out and building a, a, a new house and we've got all of our foundation ditches dug, we're gonna pour concrete and that day the law of gravity just doesn't cooperate and all the concrete goes up. Can't get anything done, right? Well, that doesn't happen with natural laws. Natural laws are steady, so are spiritual laws. And sometimes even good people are breaking spiritual laws and don't know it. Or they're not using them properly. They don't know how to play the spiritual law and use it to be blessed because God works through spiritual laws. Today I'm talking about the law of the hand. There's a scripture in Ecclesiastes 9, verse 10, where Solomon wrote, Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might. We'll get into this more in a minute. I want to talk about Joseph because he demonstrates the law of the hand better than any other character in all the Bible. Amazing story of the hand of Joseph. He's the kid who was favored by his dad, one of 12 brothers. The dad loved him more than any of the rest of them. He gave him a coat of many colors. I heard about this when I was a little bitty guy, probably six, seven years old in Sunday school. And the reason I liked the story is because I got to use every crayon in the box to color the coat of Joseph. Maybe you remember something like that too. But he gave him a coat of many colors and he was favored of his dad, which made him the envy of his brothers. They didn't like him. In fact, 10 of them were older, one younger. You had no trouble with the younger brother, but the 10 older ones hated his guts. And so he made a mistake. Joseph found out the hard way that talking will not get you where you want to go. In Genesis chapter 37, it says that Joseph dreamed a dream. Now, here's another great thing that began to happen. God's working in his life. God gives him dreams, gives him two dreams that have to do with his future. And he's so excited about these dreams that he makes the mistake of going to his brothers and he tells them the dreams. The Bible says he told this dream to his brothers and they hated him yet the more. And he said to them, here, I pray you this dream which I've dreamed. He was just really rubbing it in. I don't think he had a clue how much he was making them hate him. He was oblivious to what was going on. But he kept on doing it anyway. He thought because he was favored by God that he would be favored by everybody else. And that wasn't the case. So he made the mistake of telling the dreams. Maybe a little too much. And he dreamed that he and his brothers were binding shocks of wheat in a field. That's how you used to have to cut it. You'd have this long curved sickle knife, really sharp, and you'd grab some wheat and cut it, take a little string, tie that up, let it stand. He said, we were all doing this, but you guys, all of your shocks fell down and worshiped mine. Mine stood straight up, yours didn't. Then he had another dream, and he dreamed that the sun and the moon and 11 stars bowed down and worshiped him. Oh my gosh, he went and told his brothers. And they hated him, yet the more for his dreams and for his words. He dreamed yet another dream, he told it to his brothers, and he then told it to his father. I mean, he just didn't have a clue that talking alone was not gonna bring him any closer to this great dream that he had. He was breaking a spiritual law, and when good people violate spiritual laws, even unknowingly, they pay a price, they suffer for it. And here's the spiritual law, it wouldn't be written for several hundred years, but Solomon, the king, the wise man, said this, in all labor there's profit, but the talk of the lips tends only to penury. In other words, if all you do is talk, you're gonna be a very poor person. You gotta do more than talk. And so Joseph was breaking the spiritual law, and didn't realize it. The day came when he was sent to check on his brothers and they were far away from home, and they took the occasion to take him and throw him in a pit. At first they were gonna kill him, but his brother Judah said, hey, let's sell him for a slave. That happened later with another 
Judas who did that with our Lord Jesus. In fact, Joseph is the greatest picture of the Lord Jesus Christ in all of Scripture. There are over 30 different parallels in the life of Joseph that correspond to the life of Christ. They said, let's not kill him. Let's sell him as a slave. There was a caravan passing by at the moment. They sold him for a slave. He was taken to Egypt. And when he gets to Egypt, he gets a job, not really by his choice, where he is working for a man named Potiphar. And Potiphar's not just anybody. He's called the captain of the guard, the captain of Pharaoh's guard. One's translation of the scripture says he was chief of the butchers, meaning that Pharaoh hired Potiphar to be his top executioner. That's who Joseph is working for. So he's in the house of this guy who is no nonsense, and you better not mess with him. But the Bible says the Lord was with Joseph, Genesis 39, 2. And he was a prosperous man, and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. And his master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand. Now, one of the things that I started learning to do, and I'm pretty slow. I didn't do this early on in my study of the Bible. I just read through but I started paying attention to words. Whereas before, Joseph wants to be heard, but now that he's working for Potiphar, what he has to offer is not heard, but rather it is seen. The other thing that the scripture mentions is the Lord made all that Joseph did to prosper, but that's not the end of the sentence, in his hand. The hand of Joseph is mentioned six different times in this chapter, Genesis 39. Now, any time the scripture keeps mentioning a word or a phrase like that in his hand over and over and over again, it is for a reason. It says, Joseph found grace in his sight, and he served him, and he made him overseer over his house, and over all that he had, he put into his hand. There it is again. It goes on and on and on, six times. Meaning that Joseph is no longer talking. He's working the law of the hand. Now, I like to think that Joseph maybe had a revelation of how important this would be, but I I really don't think that's the case. I think that Joseph had to begin to use his hands because when he came to Egypt, he didn't understand anything they said. And they didn't understand anything that he said. Those two languages, Hebrew and Egyptian, were mutually unintelligible. You couldn't understand the other speaker. And so he could talk all he wants to in Egypt, but it isn't going to matter because nobody gets it. Nobody understands it. So now he realizes talking is just wasted effort. But the only thing that he sees that works is his hand. So he begins to do everything right. Everything that he touches, God blesses because he learns how to be a finisher. And eventually, he's put in charge of the entire household. The boss has completely given him his trust. You know, you need to ask yourself that question from time to time. Does my boss trust me? Really, as a leader, Pastor Steve knows this. Do my people trust me? You never reach a place, no matter who you are, where you can afford to say, I don't care who trusts me. Because there never is a place where you don't need to win and earn the trust of someone else. Joseph won the complete trust of his master. Let me tell you why. Because he didn't just do what the master said do, he took his brain to work with him. In other words, he began to anticipate what the boss is going to tell him to do. You know, when I started working for other people and early in my career, I learned one important thing. My favorite saying when my boss would call and ask, how are things going? 
I love to be able to say, I already did that. He would say, I need you to do this. I've already done it. And I started figuring out, I know what he's going to ask me to do. It's the same routine. Every week he's going to tell me to do this, this, and this. I might as well go ahead and get it done before he ever asks about it. And after a while, he's not even asking me anymore, did you get this done? He totally and completely trusts me. Now, there's a reason I'm working like that. Because the Bible says, if you've not been faithful in that which belongs to another man, who will give you that which is your own? I want what's my own. But I'm not going to get it if I don't take care of something that belongs to another person. See, a lot of you have a hard time doing good for another person because you see imperfections in that person. And sometimes they don't treat you right. And to be sure, that happens. Some of us have bosses that are absolute jerks. Some of us have box, bosses that are completely self-absorbed, don't care a thing in the world about you. You know that. But can I tell you this? There is a perfect boss, and his name is Jesus. And in the book of Colossians, the third chapter, the Bible says, whatever you do, do it as unto the Lord and not unto men. So I learned early on to go to work for Jesus. And I know that Jesus doesn't, listen to me, there's a scripture in the book of Matthew that says if you're a, a children's worker, if you give to drink a cup of cold water to a little kid, only in the name of a disciple, you will in no wise lose your reward. Who makes note of teachers giving cups of water to little kids? Who keeps track of all that stuff? Jesus does. And he says, you won't miss your reward. See, when you work for Jesus, you can bet on this. You're never going to be shortchanged. Now, he may not settle up every Friday, but he will never let you go unrequited. He will never let that happen. The payday will come. So you do what you do is under the Lord. And that way, you can work for a jerk. Some of you need to know how to work for a jerk because you work for a jerk. And I'm telling you right now, this is how you work for a jerk. You do your work as if you're working for the Lord. Somebody said he'll take advantage of you. He probably will, but he won't get by with it. Not forever. And you may wind up owning the company that he works for someday. I've had this happen two or three times where I whoop, went right around the guy that was over me. I'm telling you that God has the most amazing way of promoting people from the bottom to the top, and he does it through the law of the hand. Now, the scripture says in Ecclesiastes 9.10, whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might. Think about that for a minute. Whatever your hand finds to do. I know when that's appropriate. You see, I, I go to bed about 30 minutes to an hour after my wife every night. She's asleep already. And I have to carry a glass of water with me and put it on my nightstand every night. And I have a little flashlight and I put the glass of water, I cup it over here and hold the flashlight and I cup my hand around it so it doesn't light up the whole room. And I put that water on my nightstand. And in the middle of the night, I'm going to need a drink. I know I will. Last night, I reached over a couple of times and got a drink. But I dare not turn on the light. Turning on the light in the middle of the night in my bedroom is a capital offense. <laughs> if I wake her up, even if it's no big deal, and she can't get back to sleep, I'm telling you, I pay for it for days. So I completely understand the scripture which says whatsoever <laughs> thy hand finds to do, do it with your might. It means you don't necessarily see everywhere you're going. You're kind of feeling your way through. And sometimes you wind up a job that you really didn't intend to get. It was the only thing that showed up. Circumstances dictated. You had to take this. It wasn't your first choice. I was called to preach three weeks after I got saved. I wanted to be like the guy that led me to Christ, who was an amazing communicator. 
I wanted to be like him. He came to my high school and gave a talk, 2,500 kids, you could hear a pin drop. He was funny, he had us all in stitches, but before he got done, we're almost in tears. My football coach came in that afternoon and said, guys, the man you heard is gonna be at my church tonight. You ought to come. I said, I wanna go. Man, that guy was great. When I got saved, I thought, that's who I wanna be. I wanna be like that. That was my image of ministry, was to be able to teach and preach and bless people. Only it wasn't happening. I was in my uncle's church and he told me, I'll help you get into ministry if you come work with me and help me with my teenagers. So I was helping him and one Sunday he stopped because someone handed him a note and it came from the children's church and if it hadn't been for the fact that his wife was back there teaching, the note would never have made it to the pulpit. No ordinary teacher had that much clout, but his wife did. He said, I need one of you men to get up and go back to the children's church right now. I got two little boys back there that are fighting and causing a disruption and we need a man back in the children's church. There were men sitting all over that room, but he didn't look at any of them. He looked in the back to me, made eye contact with me, and he said, in other words, Willie, you go do this. I didn't want to mess with kids. It's Mickey Mouse. I want to do the real thing, you know. I, I, I want to preach to grown-ups, not kids. I, I, there was a lady that told me one time, well, you'd be good with kids. I wanted to slap her face. Are you kidding me? <laughs> you be good with kids. I don't want to be with kids. So I went back to the children's church, and one Sunday, one time, so I walked in. There were easy spots, sitting on the back row, two little boys, and... Uh, they're about 10 years old, and one of them has the other one in a headlock. <laughs> and so I go back there and break it up and sit between them. They're not mad at each other. They're just bored. And I'm sitting there listening to this teacher, and it is awful. It's so bad. It is just, just icky sweet. Now, boys and girls, don't we love Jesus today? Little 10-year-old boys that ride a bus don't like that. And I thought to myself, she ain't connecting with these kids. And I thought, if somebody doesn't do something, these kids are never coming back to church again. You can't make them come back. Their parents didn't make them come today. They came because we said they're going to have fun when they go to church. This is not their idea of fun. It ain't going to happen. And I, I thought, next week I'll bring my guitar and I'll play a couple of songs. And I did but we still had the same teacher. It was just as bad. So finally I went to the pastor and I said, I got nothing better to do. Uh, can I have third, fourth, fifth, and sixth grade? Can I teach those kids in another room? Can I do a, a children's church? I couldn't believe I was asking that. <laughs> I'm gonna be a pastor, but, but I, I might as well do this for a little while. Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do. See, I didn't choose that. It just kind of happened. But I did it with my might. And I started realizing trying to be icky sweet isn't going to cut it. These are bus kids. They live in the real world. They see all kinds of things our church people never see. So I thought, i got to get their attention. So I'm teaching on Jesus is the Lamb of God. And I go to the grocery store for my sermon. And I buy some baggies. They call them Ziploc now, but in the beginning they were called baggies. <laughs> and I get some Karo syrup. Some of you don't know what Karo syrup is. You're better off not knowing. <laughs> and some red food coloring. And I poured the Karo syrup and the red food coloring into that baggie, sealed it up tight, and then I made me a lamb out of newspaper, and I took my white can of spray paint, and I spray painted that lamb. And the next Sunday, when I laid that lamb up on the altar of my pulpit, I had a big rag or something up there to catch what was coming. I talked about how Jesus died. He shed his blood. I took a knife and plunged it into that newspaper lamb, and the blood went everywhere. 
there wasn't anybody on the back row less wrestling that day. And I thought, that's the way you got to do it here. So I started learning how to teach kids like that, especially little boys. I did the story of Samson. I talked about how Samson, he hung around with the wrong people. And he went after this gal named Delilah who really didn't care about him, uh, but he chased her anyway in total opposition to what God had told him to do. And she begged him to tell her, what makes you so strong? He said, if you cut my hair, I'll just be like every other man. And so she did. And they cut his hair and then they took him. And I brought out a styrofoam wig head. I painted it flesh color. And I had glued two marbles into the eye socket. And I took a propane torch. And I heated up a spoon. And I took that red hot spoon and stuck it in behind an eyeball and popped it out on the floor. And popped the other side out on the floor. And nobody was wrestling on the back row that day either. Don't you hang around with the wrong kids. I thought, you know, this visual stuff works pretty good. And so I started learning. I didn't have any books. We were in a little bitty town in West Texas. I was hundreds of miles away from anybody else who taught children, which was God's idea because he didn't want me standing up and saying to these kids that rode the bus, boys, girls, don't we love Jesus? He didn't want me teaching like that. He wanted me stabbing lambs in the gut <laughs> and poking out Samson's eyeballs and calling fire down out of heaven and burning up the calf on the altar. I, I started learning how to teach like this. It wasn't long before I got 300 kids in my children's church. And they want to come. And everywhere I go to knock on doors, people know I'm coming before I get there. And I invite all these kids. I got kids riding my buses 50 miles away, 70 miles away, one way. Easter Sunday, 1976, I personally bought 325 kids to church. I learned how to be an expert in teaching kids. I learned how to do it. It took me years to get it down, but I learned how to do it. And I learned how to hold a kid's attention. It wasn't too long after that that I was invited to teach a Bible school course shortly after I moved to Tulsa to teach pastors about the importance of kids' ministry. Not long after that, I launched a kids' TV show that made it onto every Christian TV station in all of North America, every Christian satellite network, thousands of cable systems. I was known coast to coast. Everywhere we went, we packed out churches. I couldn't go anywhere in America without some little kid saying, that's Gospel Bill. And when it was time to start my church, all those years I spent teaching kids that I thought was a waste because I really wanted to be a teacher of grown-ups. It actually came in handy because I hadn't pastored long and I began to realize they're all on a fourth grade level anyway. And so people started flocking to my church and they said, we love how you teach because you explain things. We're tired of the guys that get so deep, we don't know what they're talking about. But you, we can all understand you. And that's the reason God blessed my church. I think my greatest gift is the gift of explaining. What good is it to know something or to think you know something but you can't explain it? And that's what a teacher does. And so that's why God blessed my church in the way that he did. And that thing that I thought that was going to keep me from being able to do what I ultimately wanted to do, God just had a different pathway for me to get to the place I wanted to go. Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with your might. I was flying through the airport in Salt Lake City. Had an extra long layover. And I was wandering around and there was a shoe sign stand. And there was a guy whistling, happy, working, shining shoes, two or three helpers. But what caught my eye was his photo gallery. 
And all around the walls and the inset part of his station there, on the two end walls, all behind the seats, there were pictures of celebrities, some athletes, some politicians, some movie stars. They weren't just signed pictures. They were all personally addressed to him. So I couldn't wait to step up into the chair and to hear his story. And he told me how all these people at one time or another had passed through the airport. And they loved what he did for their shoes. And he told them, you know, I can do this for all of your shoes. And he had a little address. And they started shipping him box loads of shoes from their homes. And they'd show up at his place of business, UPS, during the week. He would shine them all up, send them all back. And he's got letters of reference from famous athletes and famous movie stars and famous politicians, and they're all thanking him. And I think, wow, this is the law of the hand. Here it is in Proverbs twenty-two twenty-nine: Seest thou a man diligent in his business? In his business. In his business. He didn't have to be a doctor. He didn't have to be a major league athlete. He didn't have to be a skilled professional. Seest thou a man diligent in his business, he will not stand before obscure men. He will stand before kings. And I saw it right there in front of me. If you're going to shine shoes, why not shine shoes before the best people in the world, the biggest people in the world? And he made excellent money. Joseph was in prison, but man, he ran a hot prison. And the jailer put him in charge of the whole thing. And it says in Genesis 39, Whatsoever they did there, he was the doer of it. You know why the jailer trusted him? Because he saw that everything that he put into Joseph's hand got blessed. This business of being diligent not only affects your business, it affects your outlook. It makes you emotionally healthy. There are so many people who've been wounded and hurt, and trampled on. I meet people all the time who are holding a grudge toward some former boss. Or Have you ever been lied about? Have you ever had a boss that told some stuff about you that kept you from getting a good job somewhere else? I've had that happen to me. I've had terrible things like that said about me. Christian people, and God vindicated me. It took a little while to happen, but... In the meantime, here's where you got to be careful. You can't get bitter. Because if you get bitter, you lose the flame. And here's what Proverbs 13, 4 says, The soul of the sluggard desires and has nothing, but the soul of the diligent shall be made fat. You know what that means? It means that when you believe in putting your hand to things and doing it cheerfully and with excellence, it heals the bitterness. It heals your soul. And even though Joseph has been treated unfairly, he's been lied about, he's been threatened with murder, he has had all hope taken from his father by a bloody coat that the brothers put in front of him, keeping that dad from ever looking for him. You talk about all of the negative things that could happen to anyone separated from his younger brother whom he dearly loved, not knowing if he would ever be able to go home again. And one day, two guys show up from the palace of the Pharaoh. Now Joseph is destined to get into the palace but he's not ready to go there yet, so God brought the palace to him. And let me tell you this. God brings the palace to you, but you won't recognize it. Because the people who come from the palace, typically at the moment you meet them, don't have any influence and don't have any power. 
So how do you treat them? You know what I've learned? I've learned to treat everybody with respect. I've learned how never, ever belittle anybody's job. I will not look down on a janitor. I started out working in ministry full-time as a janitor. That was my job. To this day, I do not like it when I go into a bathroom and see that some guy did not aim. I know what it's like to have to get down on my knees and take the disinfected spray and wipe all the bacteria off the toilet. If I go to a movie theater even yet, if I'm the only one in there, and I see a row of urinals on the wall, I can't stand it if they're not flush. I'll just go through and flush every one of them. I was in a restaurant the other day, older man, probably 50 years old, immigrant, bussing tables, pushing his little cart, had such an inferiority complex, had a hard time looking anybody in the eye. I knew nobody needed to see this transaction, but I walked over and tucked a $100 bill in his hand and winked at him. I know you, I recognize you, you're important. You're a winner. When I go back to the restaurant, I try to make eye contact with him. I wanna send him signals. Janitors are important. I chase down my garbage men every Christmas. I find them and I put $100 bills into their hands. And I say, Merry Christmas, guys. Y'all are the best garbage men in all the world. You know what they do? They bring the cans back up to my garage door now. I don't have to go to the curb anymore to get my <laughs> empty garbage cans. And I think because I've told the story, maybe some other people have started following suit. It's amazing what happens when you begin to respect the average guy. And you need to, as the average person, you keep looking to the Lord even when your boss doesn't see you. So Joseph interprets two dreams for these guys who have no clout whatsoever, a butler and a baker. He tells them both what's going to happen to them. They dream dreams. They don't know what they mean. Joseph said to the butler, you'll be back on the job in three days. You'll be back in favor with Pharaoh. Tells the baker, unfortunately for you, he's going to kill you in three days and cut your head off. Sounds going to happen. I'll cut your head off and then kill you. That's it. So anyway, it happened. And although it may seem like a negative thing, it said something about Joseph. It said that he was not a flatterer, that he was capable of telling someone the truth, even if it wasn't pleasant. So he begged the butler, tell the Pharaoh about me. Tell him to get me out of here. You and I think, if I can just meet the right person, if I can just get in with the right folks, if I can just find the right influence, but listen to me, it almost never happens the way that you want it to because it's God who brings the promotion. And you never know which person it's gonna be that's gonna be used. The butler went right back to the palace, he got promoted back to his job and completely forgot about Joseph for two years. And then Joseph got a message one day that the Pharaoh needed to see him. Pharaoh had had a dream, had two dreams. He was troubled by them. He knew they were important, but he didn't understand them. He needed someone to interpret the dreams. Nobody in the palace, none of his wise men could begin to explain what the dreams meant. Then the butler spoke up and said, Pharaoh, there's a young Hebrew in the dungeon, falsely accused, who should not be there, who correctly interpreted my dream and the dream of the baker that you executed. He can interpret your dream. So they sent for Joseph and brought him to Pharaoh's palace. And he comes before the Pharaoh with a gift that he had had from the earliest days of his life. He knew how to interpret dreams. And his gift brought him to a place of influence. So Joseph heard the dreams of Pharaoh and he said, the seven fat cows that you saw coming up out of the Nile River, 
Those are seven years of amazing plenty. The seven ears of wheat that you saw on the stalk, those are seven years of plenty. They mean the same thing because God always doubles anything when he speaks it. So he doesn't just say it once, he says it twice so you make sure you get it. He said, then you saw seven skinny, scrawny cows eat the seven good ones. And you saw seven blighted, blasted ears of wheat that ate up the good ones. He said, that means that after seven years of amazing plenty in all the land of Egypt, the famine is gonna come for seven years that'll be so great you'll forget how good the good was. That gift is what caused Joseph to be set free. But it still wasn't enough to take him to the next level. What was it that Pharaoh saw in Joseph? Why did he go from asking for an interpretation of dreams to giving him the most powerful position in the whole country. Pharaoh didn't do this just to complete a Disney Cinderella story. This is not about some guy who got lucky one day and the king said, I'm gonna take you and promote you to the top. Leaders who do things like that are not very smart. Pharaoh has a country to run. He can't take just a nobody and put him in charge of the country's agriculture just because he likes the guy, just because he interpreted a dream, there was something Joseph had, something that he picked up, something that Pharaoh could see that says, this is the guy who's gonna lead you through the next 14 years. What did Pharaoh see? Number one, it may seem like an insignificant detail, but trust me, nothing is insignificant in the Bible. Joseph shaved and put on an Egyptian cloak. He learned the culture. He dares not go in to speak to the most powerful man in the world looking like a Hebrew from Canaan because he knows he's destined to lead this country. But he knows if he's got a beard, it ain't gonna happen because Egyptians hated beards. And he knows better than to offend the culture. You think you can offend the culture and get by with it? Ask Anheuser-Busch. So he shaved and he walked into Pharaoh's palace looking like an Egyptian. He's been 13 years in the land. Now he speaks fluent Egyptian. And that is the second thing Pharaoh was able to see. Because he was able to speak to this Hebrew who seemed like a country bumpkin, or he should be, but he's not because he speaks Egyptian like an Egyptian. And he speaks it so well that when his own brothers come nine years later, they can't detect a shred of a Hebrew accent and never suspect they're talking to their brother. And he uses an interpreter to speak to them. He speaks Egyptian to the interpreter. He can understand, but he doesn't let them know who he is. You know what it tells me? He was thinking in Egyptian. He started his life thinking in Hebrew words, but now he has learned how to think in the Egyptian tongue. And if you're gonna lead a country, you have to know the language. Number three. Joseph said, Pharaoh, seek out a man who can run the agriculture. Point him over the harvest. In the seven good years, let him take out of the land surplus wheat and let him store it. Let him appoint officers over all of the cities and build storehouses so we can put back the food. This is something Joseph did not learn in Canaan. The Canaanites and the Hebrews knew nothing about administration. 
It was so much this way that when God wanted to raise up a Hebrew to lead the children of Israel out of Egypt, he had to allow Moses to be found in a basket in the Nile River by the daughter of Pharaoh who adopted him as her own. And he was raised up in an Egyptian court and he learned how to be a leader. The Bible says in Acts 7, he was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and deeds. Meaning he isn't going to let anybody treat him like a slave. Had he stayed with his Hebrew family, he would never have developed a leader's attitude. Hebrews thought like slaves, lived like victims. They couldn't openly talk about what they disagreed with. They would gripe, speaking in whispers behind the backs of their bosses. But a leader could look at the Pharaoh in the eye and say, let my people go. Pharaoh said, dear God, I've got a guy here. And then he said this, let Pharaoh put back the fifth part of the harvest every year. Pharaoh said, this guy has already calculated in his mind how much we will have to put back in order to have enough for the famine. Why shouldn't he? He is an expert in food consumption and how much an Egyptian household needs to make it. Pharaoh turns to his men and asks this question. He doesn't tell them. He asks, can we find such a man as this? There wasn't a dissenting voice in the palace they all said he's the guy Pharaoh takes a nobody and puts him in charge it's all over for Pharaoh but Joseph was not nobody Pharaoh reaches onto his hand pulls off a ring takes it and puts it on the hand of Joseph and the seventh time The hand of Joseph is mentioned in Scripture. Six is the number of a man doing all that he can do. But seven is the number of God working to finish something. I think the law of the hand might work for you. I think the law of the hand might turn things around. Oh, maybe not as quickly as you'd like to see, but I can tell you from my own experience, it's the law of the hand that God uses to turn things. And very often, it's not something that you picked or always desired to do. It was something that you wound up doing you didn't really plan on doing, but it's what you found in your hand. Whatsoever your hand finds to do, do it with your might. Can I tell you this? God based the salvation of the whole world on two hands with nails in them your sins and mine, put him on the cross. And he willingly opened his hands and laid them out for them to crucify him so that all of our sins could be forgiven. The beginning of your journey into the law of the hand is to make sure that Jesus is your Lord. Would you pray with me right now? Heavenly Father, I thank you for sending Jesus to die on a cross, to be the lamb who took the sins of the world. I believe he paid for my sin, forgave me. I believe that you raised him from the dead. 
and with my mouth I confess Jesus Christ is my Lord. Thank you, Lord, for hearing my prayer. I am saved. Amen. Thank you very much.